Periodization. What is it and should you be using it? In my opinion, periodization is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the field of exercise science. Over the years, I've seen many influencers communicate periodization as a sophisticated and advanced training method that employs various manipulations of training variables to maximize or optimize your performance. But is this true? Well, the answer is unfortunately complicated. So let's start at the beginning. When you examine the origins of periodization, you will find that it was based on Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. Now, most people assume that Hans Selye was an exercise scientist, but spoiler alert, he wasn't. He's actually an endocrinologist. Unfortunately, his theories or concepts relating to general adaptation syndrome have been used almost universally in the field of exercise and sports science, from textbooks to social media gurus to explain adaptations to exercise. For example, the three phases associated with general adaptation syndrome are often explained with an exercise science twist, which is presented as follows. First is the alarm phase, where performance drops off and the individual experiences decrements in performance, particularly when you are new to training, and employ progressive overload or introduce new aspects to your training. The second is the resistance phase. This is where positive adaptations are said to be observed. For example, the resistance phase represents the time when increases in muscle size and strength are observed. And the third is the exhaustion phase. It is suggested that without proper periodization of a training program, that fatigue will accumulate and overtraining will occur. Based on the principles of general adaptation syndrome, it is suggested that periodization should be employed to avoid the exhaustion phase and achieve something known as supercompensation. Supercompensation is when a new level of performance capacity is achieved as a result of the adaptations experienced during the resistive phase. This is believed to be accompanied with the dissipation of training related fatigue. And this is accomplished through the proper periodization of training variables. Now, recently, scientists have written about this topic, pointing out the general adaptation syndrome may not make sense for explaining adaptations to resistance training. For example, muscle growth is explained by a molecular signaling cascade, not supercompensation. Similarly, strength is explained by neural and local adaptations, not through supercompensation. So this concept can help us understand the direction of adaptations, perhaps, but it does not appear to provide valuable information on the root cause of adaptation. Moreover, Hans Zellier, who developed the concept of general adaptation syndrome, was actually interested in drug interactions, and his discovery of the general adaptation syndrome appears to have little relevance to exercise in humans. In fact, the general adaptation syndrome as it exists in exercise science is just a copy and paste of this original work, but with new attributes assigned to each phase. The original work was a series of studies in which rodents were injected with lethal and sublethal doses of various drugs and metabolic stresses. For example, Hans Salier would inject rodents with a lethal dose of formaldehyde. Upon exposure to this toxic drug, he noted what he called the alarm phase. The alarm phase tended to occur 6 to 48 hours after the initial injury, and its symptoms included but were not limited to thymus atrophy and adrenal hyperplasia. In short, this was the beginning phase of the rodent losing its immune function and beginning to die. In this light, it is quite alarming. But these symptoms would disappear during the resistance stage despite continuous exposure to these damaging agents and only reappear during the exhaustion stage when the rodent would eventually die. This resistance stage is called resistance because the rodent was resisting death for a brief period of time despite a toxic nature of the stressor. And the word general in general adaptation syndrome comes from the fact that the same general response was observed in the rodents, no matter what the toxic stressor was. Hans Salier was informing us about the high level stress during drug interactions. He became quite famous and called for other fields to apply his research to their respective areas. In exercise science, we created a really loose adaptation of this concept that hardly reflects the actual data or meaning of the original experiments. Now, the figure I'm putting on the screen here shows the original meaning of the phases of general adaptation syndrome and what exercise science has replaced the actual meaning with over time. Another interesting finding from Salier's studies was that developing resistance to one stressor would decrease your resistance to the other stressors. So if you were resisting a toxic dose of formaldehyde, a dose of morphine would be more likely to cause death. In short, Salier believed that we have a limited capacity to adapt and can only handle so much stress at one time. Okay, so now that we understand the general adaptation syndrome, we can cross the bridge to periodization. 
And if you recall, our original topic today is periodization, just in case you got too distracted with all the talk of general adaptation syndrome. With the general adaptation syndrome as its underlying theory, periodization programs are often characterized by a gradual decrease in training volume over time, while intensity increases. The decrease in volume was meant to promote recovery and manage stress. So as you can see, this is a very loose application of Solier's research. So why are you decreasing volume across the training year? Well, it's important to note that most of the classic periodization models were actually designed to balance strength and conditioning practices with athletic performance and sport practice. So, for example, over a football season, an athlete is spending more and more time playing football. This introduces a competing stressor for adaptation. Thus, it would make sense to decrease volume in the weights room to promote better recovery. So, in its most simplistic sense, periodization is simply the balancing of stresses and proper management of competing adaptations. However, over time, periodization has morphed into something else. It has become a rather overly complicated resistance training approach that seems to take several college degrees to understand. The most cited paper regarding periodization is a paper by Stone et al. The authors employed a periodized training program and compared training adaptations to a non-periodized training program. The periodized program employed a set and repetition scheme that had individuals train at five sets of a 10 rep max for the first three weeks, followed by five sets of a five rep max for four weeks, three sets of a three rep max for five weeks, and three sets of a two rep max for the final week. So if we break it down, individuals trained for hypertrophy for the first three weeks, they trained at somewhere between strength and hypertrophy for the next few weeks, and ended up lifting relatively heavy for the final week, which is most ideal for strength. Over the six week time period, training volume decreased and the intensity increased. The non-periodized group, on the other hand, performed three sets of a six rep max for the entire six weeks. Thus, this group performed a protocol that I would argue isn't ideal for strength, but it's also not ideal for hypertrophy. Volume was the same over the six weeks and the relative intensity also stayed the same over the six week period. Ultimately, the authors found that the periodized group had more favorable changes in lean body mass and strength following the six week time period. Now, proponents or advocates of the periodization would and have suggested that the superiority in the periodization group is due to the variation or periodization of the training program. However, I would ask the following questions. Why was volume decreased in the periodized group if participants' recovery was fine and there was no competing stressor? Because this seemed to be the point of decreasing volume in the original periodization models. And why did the non-periodized group perform an arbitrary number of sets and reps that was not really ideal for any of the measured adaptations? To me, this seems like the non-periodized group was set up for failure by implementing a training routine that didn't favor either of the measured outcomes. So just to give you an example, wouldn't four sets of 10 to 15 reps performed close or to failure maximize hypertrophy if that was the goal over the six week time frame, regardless of variation? And furthermore, wouldn't a low volume, high intensity protocol maximize strength if that's what the goal was over the six week time frame, regardless of variation? So as you can see, the biggest issue that I see with the current literature is the fact that simple variation in training programming is often being confused or conflated with periodization. And this is often fueled by social media influences. Now, daily undulating periodization, which is often abbreviated as DUP, for example, has you employ hypertrophy, strength, and power repetition ranges all in the same training week. Now, this is perfectly fine if you wanted to train hypertrophy, strength, and power adaptations, but if your main focus is solely hypertrophy, solely strength, or solely power, it certainly seems reasonable to reduce the variation and complexity and focus on a stimulus that will achieve the desired adaptation. From here, periods of deload or decreased training volume can be implemented as needed to promote recovery. And such a program would not need to include a lot of complexity or variation and would still promote adaptation while accounting for overall stress. Now, all this to say, I think the takeaways from today's video are as follows. If you want to employ periodization, it is not as difficult as you may have thought. Remember, it is rooted in data on stress management. 
Thus, periodization does not require precise or confusing manipulation of training variables, but instead it requires you to simply consider the stress in your life, your recovery, and your other competing stresses. So how physically or mentally taxing your job is, for example, or are you an athlete? At times when the other stresses and factors are increased, it may be appropriate to decrease your training volume in the gym to reduce your overall stress burden. Periodization happens when you acknowledge that you only have a finite capacity to adapt over time. So with this in mind, it's important to prioritize what is most important to you. And maybe try to plan your deloads when you know the other aspects of your life might get busy. This approach enables you to effectively address the challenges of stress management without overly complex and confusing recommendations often seen in the modern periodized training program, promoted by science influencers and gurus. Thank you so much for watching guys. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and be sure to subscribe to my channel. And for more educational videos just like this, or to learn about my other products and services, please check out the links in the description below and I'll see you in my next video.